Well, good morning, and welcome to Aliso Creek Church. It is so good to get to be in worship with you all this morning. Now, I have been working on something. I have this habit. Um, anytime anyone asks me how I am doing, I have a tendency to give the same exact response that I think most people, most people do this as well. So just think for a minute. If someone asks you, how are you doing? How do you typically respond? What's the first thing that you say? Busy. That's, that's like what I hear over and over and over again. How are you? Busy. I've been trying not to do that because everyone is busy all of the time, right? That's just kind of life where we live. It's life in Southern California. I think South Orange County, it might be even more so, right? We are frantically going about our lives at breakneck speed. But God's Word when he invites us into his presence, when he reminds us of the reality that he is God, what does he say? Does he say, look busy? No. His command is the exact opposite. His command is, be still. Be still and know that I am God. I am your refuge and your strength. I am your fortress. Friends, an invitation into worship is ultimately an invitation into the rest of God. Amen? Amen. So let's begin that now by going to him in prayer. So would you please pray with me? Father, we thank you so much this morning for calling us into your presence that we might begin to experience your rest. Father, help us to cling to that. Help us to be still this morning. Help us to set aside some of the things that are on our minds, set us to set aside our to-do lists, the things that might be causing stress and anxiety. Help us to be still and to know that you are God. Father, we thank you for the assurance of rest that we have in Jesus, that he has accomplished for us everything that we long to accomplish. He is our hope. He is our perfection. He is our righteousness. He is our everything. So God, again, help us to be still in his presence this morning. And it's in Jesus' great name we pray. Amen. Well, friends, I want to invite you to stand with me as God's word calls us into worship. Be still. We come to quiet ourselves in this haven of holiness. Be still and know we come to discern the word which can set us free. Be still and know that God is our hope, our help, our refuge, and our redeemer. Amen. Let's, let's remain standing as we sing. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never fails. flood of mortal ills prevailing, for still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe, his craft and power are great, and armed with cruel hate, on earth is not his
We come to the time in our service now where we recognize that 
we've sinned. We've done the things that God has told us not to do. We haven't done the things that he has told us to do. We've fallen short of everything that he expects of us. We recognize that we have sinned, and yet God has offered us a shelter. God has told us that he will be a shelter for us. Our ticket, our price to enter that shelter, to be freed from, to be safe from his wrath for the sins, is our humble confession, humbly coming to him, admitting where we've fallen short, admitting admitting how we've sinned against him, even in the past week, in the past day, coming under that shelter, that shelter that's offered because of Jesus Christ, because of his life, his death, his resurrection. So we're going to have a time right now of public confession, followed by a time of silent personal confession, and then we'll hear from God's word that assures us that because of Jesus Christ, we can be saved. We can have that perfect shelter in him. So let's read these words together, saying, Holy God, you are the shelter amid our fears. You know the sins we can't even admit to ourselves, showing your faithfulness even when we're unfaithful. Cleanse us with the precious blood of Jesus and see us as you see your righteous son. Remind us that we are redeemed, not imprisoned by our sins, and help us to live as people of hope, shared by your forgiving love. Amen. Call out to God now silently. Brothers and sisters, the good news of the gospel is that when we truly call out to God, when we truly confess our sins to him, we can be assured that he will have compassion on us, that he will forgive our sins because of Jesus Christ. Hear now the words of Micah 7.19. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. Amen. Please stand as we sing our next hymn together.
seated once again. Well, welcome again to Aliso Creek Church. So great to be with you today in worship. I have a few announcements for us wanting you to be in tune with what's going on in the life of our church. Uh, the first one is today at 4.30 p.m. we are having an all-church picnic over at Grand Park, just about a mile away. So we'd love to see you there. Bring uh, your meal, your dinner, bring a lawn chair, and this will be a great time for the whole church to come together in fellowship. Second announcement coming up on this Friday is our last Monarch Beach Day of the summer. Uh, so this is a time where around 10 a.m. We, we all show up down at the beach together as a church. We'd love to see you there for our, our final one of the summer. If you would like to come, just be sure to let us know. You can RSVP directly to Carla. Her email is in the bulletin just so that we can get you on the list through the gate and get you the right directions so that you know where to meet us. But we'd love to see you on Friday for our final Monarch Beach Day. Number three, coming up next Sunday after church, we will be having our newcomers lunch, and we would love to see you there if this applies to you. This is for first-time visitors, or maybe you've been around for a while. This is a great chance to connect with others, to meet the pastors, ask your questions, learn a little bit more about the church, all while eating some delicious meal. A delicious meal. So we'd love to see you there. Please let us know if you are coming so we can just make sure we have the right amount of food. So that'll be next Sunday, the newcomer's lunch. Number four, uh, this was highlighted last week by a presentation after the service, but we as a church are supporting a ministry to get Bibles into prisoners' hands um, in Orange County. So if you would like to participate in this, you can give. There's a special box in the rotunda after service, or you can head to our website and click on the Give tab, and there's a special link where you can help support this ministry to get Bibles in the prisoners' hands. And just as a quick side plug here, you can check out all of this stuff on our website. Um, it's really great. You can learn about what's going on in our church. You can check out our podcast. You can listen to sermons. So please do check out our website, also our social media, Instagram, Facebook. We're constantly reminding about what's going on, um, sharing stories about some of the things going on here. So please do check us out online. All right, my final announcement. Uh, we highlighted this last week as well. Uh, but this is a ministry of our presbytery where we support kids in Uganda who are in need. And right now we are looking at uh, two kids who need to be sponsored for the upcoming year. And we'd love for you to consider giving to this ministry. Um, here, every dollar put forward goes directly to them, helping them with their education, room and board, all their various needs. The cost comes out to about 450 a year to sponsor one of these kids. And we're looking at two right now to get sponsorships. So please consider this. Um, if you would like to learn more, you can connect with Rob Enfield. His uh, email is in the bulletin. All right, those are the announcements. Let's now go to our God in prayer. Mm -hmm. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you invite us into your presence and you call us to bring all of our needs to you, which we confess, Lord, are many. But you are our loving Father who calls us to yourself. So, Lord, we lift up those in our congregation uh, with all sorts of needs. We lift up those with physical needs. Many are recovering from sickness, illness, COVID. We ask, Lord, that you would provide healing. We also lift up, Lord, those with various emotional needs, those battling through the darkness of depression, anxiety, grief. We ask, Lord, that you would be living water in the desert, that they would sense your nearness, your presence, your comfort. Lord, we lift up today the family of Lee Craft as we mourn her passing last week. We thank you that through Christ, death is a defeated enemy, and we can have true hope and comfort even when we face it. So we lift up her family as they walk through uh, grief, mourning her loss. Would you be with them, bring comfort in the grief? And today, especially, Lord, we, we think of and we lift up our high school seniors heading off to college. We lift up Lauren and Campbell and Michaela as they're going to different parts of the country beginning college. We ask that you would go with them, be near to them, bless them. We ask, Lord, that you would preserve and sustain them, giving them deep Christian community while they're there through church, through ministries on campus. We ask, Lord, that this would be a very a deepening time of their faith where they would come to know you in, in greater and deeper ways. So we ask for, um, for your hand over them as they go off to college. And today, Lord, as we continue through our service and as we prepare to hear your word where you have promised to meet us, we ask that you would show us Christ. Would you lift him up? He truly is the solution to all of our deep problems, the answer to all of our questions. He is what we need more than anything. He is our King, our Savior. Would He be lifted high, and would you help all of us to look to Him in faith and trust, finding our security, our shelter in Him? Today, Lord, help us to find refuge, and really the only true refuge that we have. We know this world offers us a lot of false shelters, would we today leave those behind and come to Christ, our true Savior? And now we as a congregation pray as your son Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This morning we've looked at various attributes of God as he is our refuge, our fortress, and our shelter. And this next song really speaks to the power and the might of our God, the Lord of hosts, in this powerful arrangement of Psalm 46.
doxology in response in praise and offering to our Lord this morning. At this time, children may be dismissed to Children's Church. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here be You may be seated. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when the morning dawns. The nations rage. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, and the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. This is the word of the Lord. The first three songs today in particular actually expressed just about everything I had to say in the notes, so I'm tempted to just have us re-sing those and skip the sermon, but we will attend to this. It's an incredible passage, so let me pray for us. Father, I ask that this word of comfort, of refuge, of help, the fact that you are our fortress and that you are in our midst helping us. I pray that this would overwhelm our hearts, especially when the trials of this life threaten to overwhelm us. 
And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. In 2010, Liz and I were enjoying the vacation home of some friends in uh, the island of St. Martin's. And we were having a grand time. In fact, it was really great because there was, now remember 2010, we had no Wi-Fi there. It just wasn't working with our flip uh, phones. (laughs) And the landline in the house did not work, not once. And we thought, well, we'll take advantage of this. We'll swim, we'll have fun, we'll sit out in the sun, we'll pray, we'll read, we'll go out to restaurants. So one day, uh, we were out to lunch, and we were asked by the waitress at that restaurant, so are you ready for the hurricane? (laughs) And we looked at her. uh, We had no television, by the way, at the house, no radio. And we said, what hurricane? (laughs) So we drove back to our friend's house uh, through the gate, the security gate, and up the street. It was actually the last house up on a cliff overlooking the entire bay where the cruise ships come in. And we saw, one by one, everyone in each house below us boarding up every single window and driving away. (laughs) And we thought, where are they going? Are we supposed to go with them? Well, in the next few hours, Uh, we realized that we were stranded alone on the street at the end of this cliff. And then the winds and the rains came. (laughs) At its peak, Hurricane Earl blew at 135 miles per hour. Uh, We're Southern Californians. We're used to the Santa Anas. They're nothing like this. Electricity on the island went out and... um, The generator at our property kept dying. I kept going out and pulling the cord. It would start up and then it would die again. And the property manager just happened to flee to Venezuela to get rid of or to get away from the storm. So we were were stranded there. And we spent literally two days in the sweltering heat, no fans, no air conditioning, mopping up gallons and gallons and gallons, hundreds of gallons of water that flooded under this massive sliding glass door in the master bedroom that overlooked the bay. Um, As the windows were shaking violently, we kept wondering, are they going to explode? Now, this wasn't the end of it. Upstairs, the bathroom started to leak, uh, the shower started to drip, water came down, and then eventually globs of cement (laughs) started to reach down or come down into the uh, shower floor, and then the whole ceiling collapsed. And you could see the sky. Now, none of this was our fault, I promise you. And if you would like to lend us your vacation home, we promise we we won't crash it. We'll leave it in good condition. Now, this all came to mind as I read Psalm 46 this week again. Because what seemed like uh, an impenetrable Caribbean fortress, a beautiful home, revealed up to us its insecurity, its vulnerability, making us wonder in those moments, in that storm, are we safe in this world? Now, actually, that was more me. Liz just thought it was all a fun adventure. (laughs) But the waters roar and foam and the seas rise. The mountains tremble. And when this happens, it all tempts our hearts to shake, friends. And yet, you know, this is not simply recording material for the Weather Channel. It is about life and the storms that bear down on us. The earth shakes when a once stable job is no longer available to us, and you're told we're downsizing, we're sorry. Families rattle apart and marriages crumble sometimes, even in the church. The sudden loss of a family member or a friend can cause our hearts to tremble. Just this week, and it was prayed today in the pastoral prayer, uh, we lost probably our oldest member in this church, which brought her daughter a kind of quiet, reflective grief. And another dear member of our church just lost his father as well this week. And so in these situations, we must learn radical trust 
in the face of minor but also overwhelming threats that come at us. So we're going to walk through this passage in this way. In verses 1 to 3, we will see that God is our refuge. In verses 4 to 6, we will see that God dwells in His city. And in verses 7, the the latter verses, we will see that God reigns over the earth. First, God is the refuge in the storm. God is our refuge and strength, the writer says, a very present help in trouble. Now, it it causes us to ask what might have been the context that that led the writer to say this. Well, certainly it's written in a general way. It can speak to all of our trials, the trials of, of the people of God in Israel and ours. But it could be that there were specific historical situations that were being contemplated here when the psalmist wrote. One in particular is reflected in the book of Isaiah, chapter 37. King Hezekiah in the south, that is the two southern kingdoms in the south, once the ten northern tribes had been overtaken by Assyria and devastated and its people deported, the people in the south remained. And King Hezekiah was told that Assyria, this terrible nation with with intense military power, who had a particular awful taste for the Jews, like so many nations have. And King Hezekiah is told that King Sennacherib of Assyria is approaching Jerusalem. And so what does Hezekiah do? We're told in Isaiah 7, uh, 37 that he goes up to the temple of the Lord and he spread it out. What a beautiful image. It's the report of his, his scouts. And he spreads this out before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord. We're told in Isaiah 37, Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim, you alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Give ear, Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, Lord, and see Listen to the words that Sennacherib, and this was part of the report, has sent to ridicule the living God. And then we are told in the, another report or angle on this story in 2 Kings 19 that when Hezekiah prayed, we're told, therefore, thus says the Lord, concerning the king of Assyria... Sennacherib. He shall not come into the city or shoot an arrow into the city, for I will defend the city to save it, to save Jerusalem. And then we're told that that night an angel, one angel of the Lord, was sent to kill, to bring an end to 185,000 Assyrian men in their camp. And so, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, broke camp and withdrew. He returned to Nineveh and he stayed there. Now what's fascinating about this account is if you have been to London and the the British Museum there, you may have seen Sennacherib's, basically it's a cylinder where he recorded his exploits and his victories. And there's one there called the Taylor Prism. I've seen it. And what's interesting is, is Sennacherib is a boastful man. He He actually did talk about Hezekiah paying tribute and these different things, and he's he's arrogant and he's talking about his exploits. But scholars and archaeologists note that Sennacherib, in all of of his talk about coming against Israel, he never ever mentions that Jerusalem fell. He goes silent. You see, taking Hezekiah with him would have been his crowning achievement, but there's a kind of shouting silence. And that silence speaks to the truth that God sent an angel answering Hezekiah's prayer. And why do we say all this? Because this is not only for their historical situation, but for your present situation, friends. God will answer your prayers, albeit not quite as dramatically 
as he did Hezekiah's prayer, though he may, but he will answer truly and faithfully because he is your fortress and your ever-present help in trouble. You see, the Lord is our, our shelter, the one who will not fall down or fall apart. We run into that stronghold when we are struggling. And yet, meanwhile, the flimsy fortresses of this world that we so often trust, that, that our culture so often flees into, those will fail us, and we have to be reminded of that. Over the past three years, what have been shaky or unstable shelters or fortresses? Well, here's one. To some degree, we could say it's experts in science. Now, we appreciate these things, certainly, and they have brought us so much help, uh, help as we face health challenges, as we face COVID and so forth. But some months ago, a, a secular journalist named David Leonhardt wrote in the New York Times this, and I thought it was very interesting as we think of our passage. Many people have come to believe that expert opinion is an omniscient force, right? An all-knowing, all-powerful force. That's the assumption, he says, behind the phrase, follow the science, and the phrase, what the science says. And certainly this man believes in science. He goes on to say, it imagines science almost as a god. Science with a capital S, who could solve our dilemmas if we only listened. Boy, that, that's an insightful statement. You see, he's right. We tend to take the gifts of creation and we capitalize them into a kind of false creator. Science with a capital S, family and fitness with a capital F, house with a capital H, sports, career, romance. We do it with these things. We treat them as shelters that will cover us in all storms, but they don't, and they're not built for that. But if we would only listen instead to God, if we would only listen to the psalmist who says things like, though the freeways we drive are full of danger, we see so many brutal accidents on El Toro where we live all the time, and it's startling. And though the insecure economy could implode, we will not give way because Christ is our hope and stay, as the hymn says. Christ is our only hope and stay. He is the only one who is impregnable and immovable. And I've had to remind myself of that truth this week. Friends, he is your ever-present help no matter what trouble you are facing. But notice the psalmist deals not only with the sense of outside shelter, but inward strength. God empowers us as we trust in Him. And note that only those who can say, the Lord is the strength of my life, can say, therefore, of whom or what shall I be afraid? And friends, sometimes we need to say these things out loud to ourselves. And in fact, when we're in here, in worship, we are singing these truths to each other, to the Lord, and to our own hearts, sometimes defiantly, with joy, saying, listen to what you're saying, O soul. Sometimes we need to say these things in the midst of doubt, asking the Spirit to plant these truths deep within our hearts, to burrow them into our minds. Martin Luther, we sang his hymn today, he, he proclaimed to the church and to the world that what the Bible teaches is that we are saved by grace alone and not by our works. We can't earn it. And that brought wrath down on him, the wrath of man. And so in those threats, during those onslaughts, he penned the words to bolster his heart and ours, and we've sung them already, a mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never, ever failing. And so because of God, our refuge, friends, we can stand fearless 
at the cliff edge of doom, when you're going in for your medical exam, when you're facing a strained relationship, when you're looking at what's happening to your portfolio and, going, uh, portfolio and saying, oh my, <laughs> we can stand at the cliff edge of loss and we can know that not even sin, Satan, or death can crush us because God is our refuge. He is our refuge. And so now we turn to verses 4 to 7 and we see that God is dwelling in his city. Look at verse 5. God is in the midst of her. In, of her. God has come close to us. This is the Christmas truth in August. <laughs> God with us, Emmanuel, strong and powerful, yes, but exceedingly personal and close and tender. He is solid and unshakable, fortifying his city with his presence. In the Psalms, it is Zion. But this also can be arced over to Revelation, where we see the heavenly Zion, and God dwelling at the end of Revelation in the midst of his people, telling us it's all okay now, wiping away our tears, the tears that we cry when loved ones die. God is in the midst of his people in his city. And I want you to notice, this is really the most striking thing to me this week, that this imagery in verses 1 to 3 of violent waters, sorry to you who love the ocean, <laughs> but the seas often in the scripture represent chaos and uncertainty and threat and death. But notice the imagery, how it transforms immediately in verse 4 from a chaotic sea to a river, a river whose streams make glad the city of God. The river from which flows freshness, refreshment, beauty, and gladness. Liz and I were in Oregon, I mentioned last week, a few weeks ago, um, for a wedding uh, of a family, a, a woman, young woman who grew up a little bit in this church. And uh, we were in Portland, we kind of saw Portland, and then I realized, hey, wait a minute, I think the Columbia Gorge is kind of nearby. <laughs> So I looked it up, and sure enough, it was about 45 minutes away, and we're really glad we drove up there. It is one of the most beautiful places I've ever seen. Uh, the Multnomah Falls, and, and we hiked up that little trail there. And, and you can watch, with all these tourists, the waterfall uh, barreling over the cliff as it sprays people in the hot summer uh, afternoon, and it provided refreshment from the heat. And listen, I said, aren't we glad we made this trek? Rivers of gladness. Now think of this imagery and bring it forward to the New Testament where Jesus says in John 7, whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Out of our hearts, though we are otherwise at times low and anxious and even depressed, out of us flows rivers of living joy. Are you opening your hearts to the floodgates of Christ's mercy and strength? Many of you know the story of Johnny Erickson Tata, who was paralyzed when she was 17 in a diving accident. And she just uh, wrote on her blog last month about how much she was looking forward to heading up, and I assume she's already been up there, uh, to Lake Mary near Mammoth in the High Sierras. And she talked about her excitement of, of being wheeled out and right to the edge there of the creek, of the river that flows um, up in that area. And this is what she wrote, how easy it is especially with my disability, she's a paraplegic, actually she's a quadriplegic, to let uh, the streams of gladness dry up to a trickle. And then she said, when my life begins to lack the rushing, rushing surge of God's joy, that's my cue to take all my doubts, all my discouragements to the Lord Jesus, 
where I know he's going to open the floodgates of mercy and revive and refresh my heart. And she wanted to go to a little literal river to experience that most important river. God is in the midst of this city and a gorgeous river flows from it. And the river is Christ and all that he has for you, friends. Well, in verses 8 to 11, we see that God is over the earth. You see, this moves from the personal out to the international and all the cosmic issues as it surveys God's reign out there, but then it brings it back to you and me here. Hear the invitation. Come, behold, the works of the Lord. He makes wars to cease to the ends of the earth. It is he, it is God who breaks the instruments of battle, burning the chariots with fire. And so to the tumult in nature, but even more to the tumult in human nature, all of our raging, all of our fights, all of our disarray, God says, be still and know that I am God. He says, silence. Now again, come to the New Testament and consider that Jesus was asleep in the boat with his disciples and they awoke him on the Sea of Galilee as the, the sea was stirring up into a cauldron and a desert storm. And they shouted out, don't you care that we are perishing? And we're told, yes, He cares because he is this Lord from Psalm 46, our ever-present help in struggle and in trouble. This Lord of hosts, which means Lord of armies, rebukes the raging waters. He says, peace, be still. And we're told all was quiet. The wind ceased and chaos turned into calm. This is all imagery from Psalm 46. And it is reminding us that Jesus is the one who is Lord over everything, and he is in our midst. And he speaks his peace to us when we are worried and we're anxious. It's been said that anxiety could be defined as feelings of uneasiness, or foreboding that something harmful is going to happen without the offsetting confidence that we are secure in God no matter what. And so this is giving us that that offsetting confidence. It is saying cast your anxieties upon him because he cares for you. It is saying like Hezekiah, lay it out. Lay out, it's maybe literally a letter that you need to lay out, or an email. And put that before the Lord. Spread out, spread out your worries. Is it cancer that you're facing? Then be still and know that this God, the Lord Jesus Christ, is with you. Is it a breakup or the fraying of a, a relationship that, that's breaking your heart? And be at peace and know that Christ is God. Is it the death of a loved one, the death of our oldest church member? Know that Christ cares and he has conquered death. Are you worried about wars and rumors of wars? Know that God is not threatened by menacing dictators and he will finally silence all the rage that is in this earth. Now again, let's bring it back, some of the imagery that we've talked about to Jesus. When Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane and the Roman soldiers came upon him, uh, we're told that one of the disciples, Peter, (laughs) took out his sword, his shorter sword, to cut off the ear of one of the soldiers, which he did. But Jesus responded this way, put your sword back. Now think of Hezekiah's prayer and how God responded, sending one angel 
to wipe out 185,000 enemies of God's people. Jesus says, do you think I cannot call on my Father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels, tens of thousands upon tens of thousands of the armies of heaven. But Jesus didn't do that, of course. Instead, the Lord of armies, friends, he laid down his arms on the cross for us who tend to tremble when the seas and when life rage unpredictably. I do that, and I need him. He sacrificed himself for us so that we would be not just temporarily, uh, temporarily secure, but eternally secure forever. That's what our songs have been about today. He rose to conquer chaos. He was exalted so that the rivers of life and joy and gladness would flow from us now, would flow from us who would otherwise dry up forever. And so we say as we sang, O oh Jesus, I will hide in you. I will hide in you as my shelter. And so this psalm circles all the way back to where it started. The God of Jacob is, is our wonderful shelter, but he's also with military imagery. He is our fortress, the one who shelters us from the bombs and the onslaughts and the devastation of life. And some, sometimes that's literal, of course, for people around the world. Tim Keller, who, as many of you know, is dealing with pancreatic cancer, reflecting on this passage, prayed it and said it this way, though earthquakes and tidal waves dissolve the solid world and civilizations melt, Christ's rule is unshaken. And if this God, the only God, is with you, then even the worst thing that happens to you, which is death, this only makes you infinitely happier and greater. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. <clears throat> and that by this one little word, as Martin Luther penned the great hymn, we shall fell Satan. And we can stand against um, the chaos of life, those things that threaten to undo us. God, sometimes as we live in this world, it is literally the unstable physical world in which we live. Earthquakes, Storms that, that ruin people's houses and, and lives. But God, it is also the, the things that those storms and earthquakes symbolize. And so I pray for each and every person today as we are here amidst very peaceful weather and climate, it doesn't always mean that our hearts are that way. So God, I pray that for each and every person here, whether it's worry or depression or discouragement over a broken, straining relationship, or the sadness that is felt at the loss of a loved one. And we're dealing with that as a congregation. Father, I pray that underneath those things there would be a more powerful sense of the security that we have in Jesus. We thank you that he is our shelter and our fortress and that he dwells in our midst and that he says to the storms of our lives, peace, be still, quiet. And that he says to our souls, be at peace and be glad. We thank you that he is the river of life and from us flow gladness and joy and hope and peace in this very topsy-turvy and chaotic world. God, as we go to the Lord's Supper, I pray that you would feed us and nourish us and strengthen us 
to stand strong, especially when we feel weak. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Jesus is the fulfillment of Psalm 46. He's our fortress. He's our shelter. He dwells among us. And he gives us these very tangible signs to feed on him, to know that he's here, to know that in his city uh, there's a feast. And someday we will experience that in fullness, but now we get to experience this in part tasting his joy, tasting his peace. And we do so because the Holy Spirit takes these elements and helps us through them to feed on the risen Jesus. There's nothing magical about these. It is about the power of the risen Christ calling us to be nourished by him. And so Jesus invites all of you who trust in him alone for salvation, he invites you to come and to receive from his hand. If you're not yet there trusting him, then, then he calls you to realize that every other fortress is flimsy. Science, your house, your health, even your family, none of those things can be what Christ must be for you. So we encourage you to trust in him and believe in him. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and after giving thanks, he broke it, saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant, sealed in my blood for the washing away of your sins. As often as you drink of this, do so in remembrance of me. We invite you to come and take the Lord's Supper. is all
I got a big piece of heaven there, so <laughs> give me a moment. <laughs> and the cup of salvation, the blood that takes away our sins, the river of gladness. Let's drink. And all of God's people said, amen. Let's stand and sing our closing hymn. Thank you for being here at Aliso Creek Charismatic Church. That was wonderful. <laughs> uh, remember that we're having a picnic today, 4.30, so come with your food, or, or you know, if you've already eaten, that's fine. We'd love to see you there. And now, may our God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, your fortress, your shelter, may he grant you strength and peace 
and rivers of gladness. Amen. Amen. Yeah. 